Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker. I am an author, a speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I'm passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. Ah, these are some of my all-time favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Israel Bible Center is constantly creating new content for our students. We regularly add new roundtable talks with world-renowned scholars. We hold monthly online and free seminars, and we release new courses just about every month. One of those new courses was produced by one of our associate faculty members, Dr. Taylor Gray. Along with teaching at IBC, Dr. Gray teaches Biblical Hebrew and Aramaic at the Israel Institute of Biblical Studies and is the Assistant Research Professor of Classics and Ancient Mediterranean Studies at Penn State. Today we have an opportunity to talk about his newly released course called Divine Imagery in the Biblical World. I really enjoy these kinds of classes because they help modern readers separate their own cultural assumptions from those of the people in the ancient world. Before we dig into imagery and iconography, I asked Dr. Gray to give us a little background to himself and what drew him to study these ancient pieces of art. Lean in and enjoy the conversation. My journey kind of begins with where I went to undergrad. So I initially came out of high school thinking I was going to go into parachurch ministry. And so uh, a couple of friends of mine and I uh, moved to Denver and we attended Colorado Christian University. And at the time uh, I enrolled as a youth ministry major who knew that existed, but it does. Um, And so I started studying that, but I quickly became really interested in, in theological discussions. I had never encountered people who were so intelligent, who were sort of philosophizing over these really interesting questions about like the nature of God and how to interpret the Bible and what all this sort of stuff means. So I quickly transitioned to a theology major. At the time at the university, there was not a biblical studies major, though um, the theological questions quickly became tired for me. Uh, I realized that everything revolved around interpretation, hermeneutics, exegesis. And so uh, I was a theology major, but I really customized my journey or my education, I suppose, to be much more um, biblical studies oriented. And at the end of my undergrad, some of my mentors at the university encouraged me to go to grad school rather than to go to seminary, because by that time I decided that I I didn't really want to go into ministry. Uh, I wanted to do more the traditional academic study of the Bible. I found that a little bit more interesting, and I'd taken Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, went to the, the University of St. Andrews, and I decided at that time I was going to do Hebrew Bible instead of New Testament for all sorts of reasons, but I I just find the Hebrew Bible much more interesting. Uh, The Hebrew language is is fascinating and and a lovely language. And so it's it's a lot of fun. And when I was there right away, I realized that a lot of people were talking about material culture and using material culture, specifically iconography, to interpret biblical texts. And I'd never seen this done before. And so within probably the first two months of being at St. Andrews, I was reading everything I could get my hands on with regard to interpretation of iconography, the use of images or symbols and motifs as kind of windows into the ancient world. My previous experience of sort of contextualizing the Bible was all comparative literature. You know, you read Enuma Elish or you read the Book of the Dead or whatever, and then you sort of situate some biblical material within that context. But I had never really encountered anyone doing that with images. And so uh, I quickly gravitated that way. I have a sort of a a creative interest in art more generally. And so this sort of fit my hobbies. And so uh, I started reading a lot more about art theory 
and how scholars interpret art and archaeological stuff. And that sort of led into trying to develop ways of thinking about iconography and its relationship to the Bible. And I've, I've not really looked back since. Um, my dissertation involved some iconography, but it, it was a little bit more philological than maybe I wanted it to be. But that had to do with the nature of the question I ended up asking and, and the evidence. I just didn't quite have the iconographic evidence that I wanted to, to work with. But that's sort of how I ended up kind of working with iconography and, and thinking about it and, and studying it. It is so great because now we at IBC get to benefit from all of your study because you have a fairly new course that's out, which I would just highly recommend for everyone to go take. We're going to talk about some things related to your course, but but we don't have any images just because of the nature of this being a podcast. And I personally am a big picture person. I always am teaching with maps and pictures and things. And I felt like we were kindred souls in that way when I was going through your class because of all of the pictures, which is delightful. But even, even just thematically, we very recently on the podcast, were talking about archaeology and biblical interpretation. And then we talked about the form of God, like, does God have a form? And what is that form? And you kind of open your class with this question. You know, we have several stories where there is a human and they have some sort of divine encounter. So we can think of Abraham meeting up with the three beings, whatever they yeah. are. Or one of my favorites, this has been on my mind recently in Exodus 24. It's when Moses, Aaron, and 70 of the elders go up Mount Sinai. And it says, and they see God and sit and eat and drink, which begs the question, what were they seeing? It is an excellent question. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if only we could have been there, you know. Um, yeah, I, this, this, this question of, of viewing the divine is, is a fascinating one because at least from a historical perspective, if we, if we situate the Hebrew Bible and these descriptions of encountering the divine within the context of the ancient Near East, one of the things that kind of comes as no surprise if you read any of the material that comes from a couple of thousand years earlier is that ancient people more often than not conceptualize divine beings as embodied coming back to like Benjamin Sommer's um, argument in in his book and his discussion and and so it, it's kind of no surprise that we get this anthropomorphizing of the divine body in the biblical literature as well you know, yeah, Moses and company go up on Sinai and they see they see the divine and he's embodied and and apparently it's an anthropomorphic one. And I mean, we get the same sort of language in other Pentateuchal texts where Moses speaks face to face with the deity. And and we could sort of interpret this metaphorically, but I think in the ancient world, this is this is pretty literal. And and you get this idea even more expressed when when uh Moses is the only one who who has been able to do this. And, you know, as you know, in Deuteronomy 4, the Deuteronomistic writers emphasize very clearly, like, you saw no form when you were at the mountain. So that sort of indicates that, you know, there is one or there could have been one and they just didn't see it. And, you know, the the stories in the Torah are just a couple of examples, but Isaiah and Ezekiel seem to see a very yes. embodied deity as well. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and what's really fascinating, if we you know want to rope in iconography at this point, when we look at the iconographic tradition, when we look at the way that people depict their gods, this is exactly what they look like. More often than not, they're anthropomorphic. Um, there's sort of a transition in Mesopotamia in particular away from anthropomorphizing the deities. There's this move in the Neo-Assyrian period to sort of depict them as celestial symbols or to sort of blend their bodies with like the moon or the sun or a winged disc of some kind. But more often than not, they look like humans. And so when when these biblical characters are encountering the divine, it uh, it comes as no surprise. I mean, sometimes they even say, I saw an ish, you know, they, they, they use the, the word for man when when they're describing these these not only God, but also these divine messengers. You know that sometimes they don't even recognize that they're not like right. uh, that they're that they're not um, humans. You know they just are like oh I saw a guy. 
It maybe before, because I think even just with that introduction, there's lots of questions that spring from that, but maybe we should, uh, back up and just say, what is iconography? Just so that everyone is thinking the same thing when we're using that term. Sure. So iconography can kind of mean two things in my world. On the one hand, iconography refers to pictorial media in the ancient world. We could we could just call it art if you wanted to. Some people don't want to call it art, but let's call it art. It's It's all beautiful and it looks great and they look like they make it for fun sometimes. So it's probably art. But in any case, it's it's visual depictions that we would identify as paintings or carvings or objects created in the round, like statues or you know reliefs, ivories, all sorts of. I mean, this is just some of the stuff it's made out of. But I mean, yeah. So iconography refers to the the pictorial depiction of things, but it also is a is a field of study. So in art history, there's a whole discipline that's devoted to analyzing these pictorial depictions, whether that be, you know, the individual meanings of, of a particular symbol or a color or the way that the scene is sort of crafted. So in both cases, iconography is just taken from a couple of Greek words that have been stuck together, icon in Greek and graphe. So if we were to woodenly translate that, we get something like image writing. And Oftentimes, this is how it's interpreted too. It's it's taken as sort of a form of communication that we can interpret. There, each of these symbols or these constellations of symbols produce some sort of meaning that we're supposed to take out of it, or at least an ancient viewer was supposed to take out of it. We have to remember that so many people in the ancient world were not literate. And so we think of communicating with words, although with modern technology, I mean, we're a big fan of emojis. So we've kind of gone back to the picture and just how much meaning can be embedded in a picture. So it might just be one single picture, but from that you get the position of that God to other gods or what the role of that God is or who the king is in relationship to this God. And so they really can be very full of information. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. The, the world in which the Bible sort of emerges in, in indeed the world of Mesopotamia and Egypt and Anatolia, the Levant, all of these ancient civilizations and cultures are largely illiterate. And so there, there's a small elite group of people who are trained as scribes and they develop their craft and they do their scribally things. But for the average person, they have a different sort of literacy and it's an image sort of literacy. They're capable of recognizing pictures and what the pictures communicate because they can't read cuneiform or they can't read Egyptian hieroglyphs or the, or whatever, Hebrew, whatever. And even the emergence of language itself comes from the image. I mean, if we look at early forms of, of cuneiform in Southern Mesopotamia, or of course, in the case of hieroglyphs, um, we know that they're both, uh, they, and the alphabet for this matter, um, they all sort of emerge out of this pictorial context. And so even the written word kind of blends into this sort of image-like literacy. So humans have been communicating through images and pictures for a very long time. But what about the study of iconography? I think of this because many of the objects that are studied are found in archaeological digs, and archaeology has its own history. It started with a lot of treasure hunters who were not digging to analyze the past as much as trying to find big monuments, statues, and such. But archaeology has grown to become more systematic and scientific. As it does, and as more objects are found, there are more images for iconographers to study. So I asked Dr. Gray, what is the history of iconography of the Near Eastern world? Yeah, it's a fascinating history um, because ancient Near Eastern studies, if we can talk about it in this way before, like, I mean, in, in the, you know, uh, late 19th century, we aren't talking about things like Assyriology quite yet. But I mean, the study of the the context in which the Bible emerges, because this is where ancient Near Eastern studies come from. Uh, I mean, everyone is interested in figuring out where Abraham was from or something like that, and or finding Sinai. And in this context, the the major scholarly enterprise is philology and 
text interpretation or archaeology in the sense of we're going to find Ur or we're going to dig up some, you know, we're going to find the Bronze Age in, in Israel or something like that. The study of iconography sort of emerges as kind of a hobby horse among certain archaeologists, early Assyriologists, and some art historians. There, you know, if you if you pick up early histories of the ancient Near East, you'll see some chapter on art and architecture in Mesopotamia or art and architecture in Egypt. But the the really the sort of more methodologically rigorous study of iconography in the ancient Near East doesn't really emerge until the mid 20th century. And that has to do with, you know, the history of art, art history, um, sort of this attitude towards the Orient and the kind of art that they were creating. Greece really invented art and they had the beautiful stuff and all the stuff in the East was all barbaric and we don't really care about all that kind of stuff. But as Assyriology and biblical studies uh, expands, as well as Egyptology, there becomes more and more interest in the art for its own sake. And uh, in the context of biblical studies, the sort of the modern foundation of the study of iconography really begins with Othmar Kale. He, in the 70s... He radically transformed my view of the ancient world. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And same. I mean, and I think, I think for, for many people in who were trained as Bible scholars, um, they have a very similar experience. They read his, you know, symbolism in the biblical world and were mind blown that there were all these images, there were all these artifacts that, that kind of accompanied or displayed what the text was saying. And it was no longer, we're going to look at, you know, like some, Italian painter from the 15th century and their interpretation of a biblical text, we're, we're getting images that are contemporary with the, with the composition of these texts. And it's like, this is what they were talking about. And so Kale really sort of begins this process. And now it, you know, in, in 2023, the, the study of iconography with regard to the Bible has really blossomed in the, in, into a whole subfield and and so you can find people who are specialists in iconography and that's what they study and they work on methodology, you know, artifact biographies, cross-cultural transmission of artistic motifs. Were there certain local artists that traveled around? Did they not? You know, how did these things uh, develop? But then also people um, like... Uh, Brent Strawn is is a really good example, or or Joel Lamone, Isaac De that these these guys are are trying to use images to interpret texts. How do these images help us better understand not only the context but the content of of a biblical text? Well, it's another facet, I should say, of going to actually see the land itself. I always find historical geography like standing in the places and going. Oh, oh, okay. Like now I just get it in a different way. If the wilderness is going to turn into a garden, now I understand why that is such a big idea. And and I I find that to be pretty similar with iconography. It like you said, it's the contemporary image for the words that are currently on our page. And if we can match them, there, there's something enriching about the way that we then read the Bible because of that. I think so. I, I, I really do agree with that. And I think, you know, at its worst, this sort of method can be just seen as sort of finding ancient pictures to illustrate a text. And in some cases, that's what some studies do. And we need to do that. That's very useful. But um, at its best, these images communicate something to us that we don't necessarily find stated explicitly in the biblical literature. It tells us something about how ancient people see the world or conceptualize time and space and representation, like very, very abstract ideas, but it really brings home how different these people thought about the world than in comparison to to how we do, you know? Um, it's it's just fascinating. I, I can give you an example that that's recently been talked about. Um, a, a teacher of mine, uh, William Tuman, and an, an, another scholar at Harvard, Andrew Teeter. They they just published an article in 2020. They make this observation that uh, the way that the biblical that some biblical texts read uh, is is really difficult because they they sort of juxtapose time and narrator, and there are all these sort of 
really sticky issues of coherence in the text. And they suggest that um, just maybe if we look at iconography, let's say Egyptian iconography, we can learn something about perspective. In the modern world, we sort of have this way of telling stories, oftentimes anyway, in a linear sort of way. And we prefer film that have a beginning and an end and a coherent story. But when we look at something like Egyptian iconography, the way they depict space and architecture and people and all of these things, we see that multiple perspectives are juxtaposed in the same work. You get a view of the top of a building while a profile view of a human and maybe this weird side view of a tree all in the same work. And it, <laughs> yes. and it, it, it just doesn't make <laughs> good sense to us. Like we, we would see that and you would think, well, you should probably, you know, take another class on perspective or something, you know, right. like that's not how, how we do this, but, but maybe this art is telling us something about how they see the world, or at least maybe when they want to represent it, they want to do something different. And so there's, there's a lot of value to looking at, at the artwork in, in this way, not only from like a religious pers- or like the history of religion or, or concepts of God, but just like generally how stories are told. And so in because we have so many of these, what role are they playing in life and where are they being found? So we tend to focus on like the walls of temples in Egypt, for example, or the palace in Nineveh, uh, because we just have so many images from those locations, but those are not the only locations. So can we tell just based on where things are found and how big they are or small they are, can we tell what role they are playing? Yeah. Uh, in some cases, yes. In other cases, it's, it, it's a little bit trickier. But I mean, so like in 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 iconography and iconographic studies, there's sort of this distinction between uh, major and minor art, or uh, you could think of say like monumental art and local trinkets that you have created that you carry around on your body. And so like in the case of Nineveh or, or, you know, the, the wall reliefs at Karnak or something like this, these are major monumental constructions that were commissioned by Kings cost tons of money to make and required exceptional uh, craftsman's craftsmanship that, you know, and and we, oftentimes these are dug up in controlled excavations and and all this sort of stuff. And, And we have a decent sense of like what these images are communicating. In the case of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, images of war and and conquest are used to terrify visiting uh, diplomats that are entering into the palace, for example. But in the case of, you know, everyday artifacts, we find them in, in houses. We find them ritually buried in really interesting ways, like figurines and things like that. You know, seals are found grouped together in a, in a horde, uh, among other. Uh, and by seals, I mean just these small little, uh, oftentimes they're they're stone objects that are used to impress either an image or or uh, your name on a letter or like a jar or something like that. And these often contain. Uh, images that communicate things like good luck or good life or request blessing from from a particular deity. And so the fine context, honestly, is just about as, as varied as you can imagine when it comes to archaeological excavations. Um, everything from sort of like private households to uh, monumental architecture associated with the palace. And so imagery uh, or iconography is found everywhere. And and it it just depending on where it's found, we might have a better sense of you know what it was used for or what kind of ideas it was trying to communicate. And in other cases, it's a little more ambiguous. Like the Judean pillar figurines are a great example. Like it's not entirely clear what's going on with these things, uh, the way that they're disposed of, why they're broken. But we know that they mean something and we have lots of them. You should describe them because you show great pictures in the class. But for those who are listening who don't have an image pop into their head of what these figurines are, could you describe them? And they they vary. So it's not like a cookie cutter statue yeah. by any means. But there is a theme. There is a theme. Yeah. So they are... They are very suggestive figurines. They, uh, they're, they're often created. Uh, so the way that they look is the bottom half is uh, just sort of a pillar shape. It's just a cylinder and with a little taper so it can stand up. The top half of the figurine 
is a female body from say the navel up and she has really large breasts more often than not and her arms are sort of supporting them in some sort of way and it's unclear what exactly this posture is suggesting we have other imagery from both egypt uh, and syria that have women depicted in similar sorts of postures but um, this particular configuration is still a little ambiguous but uh and then the the head of the figurine is either made out of sort of a stylized pinched face uh or it's more we would say realistically depicted uh but the figurines differ you're right um they're they're different kinds i would suggest for anyone who's interested aaron darby has a wonderful study on the judean pillar figurines and uh it's called the judean pillar figurines and it's a it's a lovely book And um, for anyone interested in in, in reading more about this, I think she has probably the most methodologically rigorous um, attempt to make sense of what's going on with them. It is interesting because there's so many different types of materials that are often used as well. So we have ivory and the Phoenicians were known for being great artists using ivory, but they show up all the time in Israel or in Israelite areas because we have a huge cache of them up north in the Northern Kingdom of Israel area. So is there something about even just the material that things are made out of that is also giving us hints and clues as to how to interpret what is being etched into that material? Yeah, um, material is a really fascinating thing when it comes to the construction of particularly like ritual artifacts. So the ivories are no doubt created out of ivory because it's a it's a precious material and it's seen as a sign of status. Um, I mean, we see this uh, chastise in Amos, you know, um, I think it's in Amos 5 that the, the, the Israelites have have beds of ivory and it's a sign of wealth, but it's also a sign of their negligence um, towards the, the poor and the oppressed. But in the in, in in the case of the ancient Near East, what's really fascinating is we have these things called God lists, which are texts that describe all various gods that exist in in a particular cultural context. One of the things that we find on these god lists are not only the names of deities, but materials. So things like gold, silver, lapis lazuli. And what's even better about it is that these are unambiguously identified as divine in some sort of way. And so the fact that there are materials that are associated with the divine, say gold, indicate something about the kind of object that they're creating. They're using a particular material because they want the object to have this sense of divinity about it. And gold is a particularly good one. It doesn't tarnish um, very easily. It, it doesn't rust. You know, It's this sort of enduring metal. And so I can give you a couple of examples of where this plays out. So in the Louvre, there are statues, these small figurines that are uh, depictions of what appear to be the storm god of Ugarit, Baal. And what's really cool about these statues is they're made out of multiple materials, and the body of the deity is constructed of bronze, relatively cheap, though, I mean, still the Bronze Age, so it's not necessarily the cheapest thing around, but it's it's uh, it's it's not as expensive as gold. But what we see on these figures is that um, the face, the head, the hands, of the statue are gilded in gold. And these are all symbols of divine status. And we also see this in the case of votive offerings. There's this lovely votive offering also at the Louvre um, dedicated to an Amorite God named Amuru. And this, the, the, the guy who's dedicating it, Lunana, his uh, votive offering has his hands gilded in gold and his face gilded in gold. And it seems like the idea that's being communicated is the material is a pure substance and you're supposed to use your hands and mouth in the process of prayer. And so the the statue itself is communicating that I come before the deity with clean hands, which is something we see expressed in the Psalms. Um, and so the material communicates the same sort of idea that we see in the texts. Dr. Gray mentioned Amos 5 and also the Book of Psalms. So yes, what do we do with this iconography and the reading of the Bible? 
You'll have to come back next week to find out. If you enjoy conversations like this and are not yet connected with Israel Bible Center, consider joining our growing international group of students. From the comfort of your home and at your own pace, you can take classes and within a year, earn a certificate in Jewish context and culture. Thank you, Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related. 